Denazification, demilitarization and a neutral status. These are Russia's goals in pursuing the war in Ukraine. But are they really? Or is the war in Ukraine simply part of a larger plan? Is it just about Ukraine or about undermining the entire world order? And if so, what would this new order look like? What role does China play in it? And what would happen to Europe? To answer these questions, we analyzed strategic Russian and Chinese documents, declarations, and official and unofficial statements by representatives of these countries. Moscow, December 15, 2021. The Russians give these documents to the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State. They are draft agreements on security guarantees between Russia and the U.S. and between Russia and NATO member states. When we look at the content of these drafts, the word Ukraine appears only twice. This shows that from the beginning, Ukraine has been an important element of the Russian demands, but not the only one. The Russians are not hiding their objectives. First, the Russians say their goal is the so-called demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine. These slogans mean subjecting Ukraine to real political control by Russia and a severe limitation of its sovereignty, because Russia will decide what Ukraine can choose to do as a state, what policies it should pursue, what armed forces it should maintain or rather reduce, and de facto this means precisely a limitation of Ukrainian sovereignty. Speaking of the security order in Europe, the kind of ultimatum that Russia presented in December 2021, submitting to the US and NATO two draft documents of the so-called security agreements from the United States and NATO member states, Russia had de facto written out its demands. These include the withdrawal of Allied troops from eastern flank countries, a ban on the deployment of nuclear weapons outside countries that possess them, a ban on further NATO enlargement, restrictions on military exercises, limitations on military presence in former Soviet countries, and many more. The consequences of the implementation of Russian demands regarding European security would be the de facto undermining of the NATO enlargement process, the introduction of a category of watered-down second-tier NATO members, a partially demilitarized area in Central Europe, a security buffer zone, and the withdrawal of the United States from Europe, because it is also clearly stated that primarily nuclear armaments, that is, US nuclear weapons, should disappear from Europe. But in general, the whole idea is aimed at getting the United States to withdraw its military presence and its political influence from Europe, which is linked to it. Countries in Eastern Europe would be largely defenseless against Russia. But again, this is not the end of the story, because all of this is also part of a broader plan on a global scale. The Russians actually believe and talk about the fact that the current international order, which they call the Western order or the Western dominated order, has collapsed and that we are dealing with the formation of a new post-Western order, explicitly meaning a post-Western order, which is sometimes termed a multipolar order in order to be politically correct, but actually it is an order realistically dominated by China, cooperating with Russia, and to a lesser extent with other non-Western states. Russia would like to create such an order that would neutralize this dominance of Western states, especially the United States, by de facto accepting Chinese leadership in the new order, but playing the role of a very important key partner of China. This would lead to the main adversary, the West, headed by the United States, to be weakened and marginalized to the point where it can no longer intervene in the expansion of Russia's presence, its influence and the realization of its interests. All this is born out of the words of Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov himself, who on March 16, 2022 said, this is not about Ukraine at all, but the world order. The current crisis is a fateful, defining moment in modern history. It reflects the battle over what the world order will look like. In this game over the world order, the Russians have a great ally, China. Beijing, February 4, 2022. Vladimir Putin visits Beijing. The excuse for the visit is the start of the Beijing Olympics, but the real reason behind it is different. Russia is seeking counsel on its next steps to undermine the European order, 
and what that should look like. On this day, February 4th, 2022, the Chinese and Russians signed this declaration. Myślę, że ta deklaracja 4 lutego między Chinami a Rosją I think that this declaration from February the 4th between China and Russia will go down in history as one of the key moments in the preparation for this war. What this declaration contains is this general approach to the international system that the Russians share with the Chinese. An approach that sees the United States as this primary causal force, the primary threat to the Chinese in the Indo-Pacific and to the Russians in Europe. And that there is a deep synergy between these two theatres. The document contained Russian declarations of support for the Chinese approach to Taiwan and the security situation in the Pacific. In turn, the Chinese, in that declaration and many times thereafter, expressed their understanding of Russia's legitimate security concerns. So what does this mean? Legitimate concerns that the Americans, through NATO expansion, are trying to enter the Russian security space, backing Russia into a corner, so to speak. And these are words that come directly from the Chinese side, both in official communications and in formal talks. There is a certain understanding that Russia had to react because the Chinese look at it through the prism of their own problems. They see the situation in the Pacific as a result of American pressure, the tightening of alliances arming Taiwan or other countries in that area, and they transfer the same optics to the situation in Europe. The Chinese also understand very well that this war is not just about the Ukraine question. From conversations with the Chinese, we can see a general framework of how they view this war. Much of this goes beyond the specific tactical situation in Ukraine. The Chinese are the most interested in systemic issues. These are global issues, issues of the future of the security order in Europe and how the resolution of this war might translate into their own Indo-Pacific situation. Now it's time to look at the clue of Russia's accusations against the West. The Russians claim that the enlargement of NATO to include, among others, Eastern European countries has violated Russia's so-called security interests. However, the problem is one of definition. There are plenty of tools in international law to enhance mutual trust and security. They are expressed, for example, in the Helsinki Final Act or the Vienna Document. States can apply measures that will increase the transparency of their military actions. These include not holding unannounced military exercises, inviting observers, carrying out mutual inspections, declarations of arms levels, verification missions, and many, many others. Problem polega na tym, że Rosja the problem is that Russia was demanding something much bigger. What Russia was really demanding was that certain countries be barred from exercising their rights by being members of military alliances. Such a de facto exclusion of the possibility of membership would be a real restriction of sovereignty. Why did Russia want this? In my opinion, it wanted it not because it felt threatened, but not without basis. It believed that in a situation where such a state would become a member of NATO and the European Union, as these things were often discussed and considered in tandem, it would no longer be possible for those states that had previously been either part of the Soviet Union or part of the Soviet bloc to be under Russian influence. This in turn makes it impossible for Russia to rebuild its sphere of influence, which was and is the real goal of Russian policy. So we are talking here not so much about a cause, but about an excuse. Moreover, in a situation where there was already an enlargement of the European Union, an enlargement of NATO, Russia was continuously fighting to de facto neutralize the consequences of this process. In the case of NATO, for example, it was a matter of imposing restrictions on countries, the new NATO members, regarding their armed forces and, in particular, the Allied presence on their territories or military activity. Russia demanded the implementation of these restrictions and, in part, 
but in a very loose and non-legally binding form, they were included in the founding act on mutual relations, cooperation and security between NATO and the Russian Federation, where it was mentioned that in the foreseeable future, NATO doesn't see a need to permanently deploy significant new combat forces. It was not even mentioned there that new member states were involved. But, let's remember, it was a political declaration, a declaration related to the whole process of regulating Russia-NATO relations, where Russia accepted a myriad of commitments to respect the sovereignty and security rights of its partners, and which it eventually broke, and broke all of them by, de facto, carrying out a policy of aggression, primarily against Ukraine, but also by carrying out various aggressive actions against member states. Russia, too, fought to limit the de facto consequences of a European Union enlargement. Russia demanded compensation. Russia demanded the right to exclude its special relations and certain regulations from European law, especially on energy policy and its relations with Central European countries that were joining these structures. So, in fact, we had a situation where Russia, under the pretext of defending its legitimate interests, de facto tried to preserve certain elements and levers of its influence in these countries. Z chińskiego punktu widzenia na poziomie strategicznym. From the Chinese point of view at the strategic level, this Russian drive to dismantle the European security order by force is a positive development. The Chinese are looking for a precedent for undermining the American world order, and that precedent in Europe has had far-reaching consequences for the entire cohesiveness of the network of American alliances. Because if, using force, the Russians succeeded in forcing the West to talk and increased their influence by presenting them with phase accompli, not only in Ukraine but regarding the entire European security order, it would first mean the defeat of America and, secondly, it would probably mean very high tensions in transatlantic relations. That is, in some way, it would separate Europe from how the Americans think. On top of that, there is also the Chinese-specific perception of who the main actor is in this fight. Because conversations with Chinese analysts or officials who come to Europe quite often indicate that for them, this war that the Russians are waging today with NATO or NATO with Russia is a certain military training for the US alliance network. The Chinese say that if NATO succeeds in beating Russia in Ukraine, then, first of all, it will unlock the possibility that the entire American alliance system and the Pacific and NATO alliance systems will somehow turn their weapons towards China. But this is followed by sometimes even conspiratorial elements of Chinese thinking, that if NATO succeeds in beating Russia, then this know-how the Americans have developed in Europe of coordinating their allies will be carried over to the Pacific, and they will turn the American network of alliances that already exists in the Pacific into something much more solidified and institutionalized. Here the Chinese mean an Asian or Pacific NATO, which they would see as a very big problem. But why did Russia start implementing its demands precisely from Ukraine? Chodzi Rosji faktycznie o to, żeby podporządkować sobie państwo ukraińskie. What Russia is really concerned with is subjugating the Ukrainian state, which is the largest, strongest state in the so-called post-Soviet area, which Russia considers as its natural sphere of influence. Without control over this area, where Ukraine is the main obstacle, Russia cannot fully consider itself, in its own terms, a great power. According to Putin himself, it was the prospect of Ukraine's NATO membership that was one of the reasons behind launching the so-called special military operation. However, there are many indications that this is not true. Here, we have to go back to the presidency of Viktor Yanukovych. This Ukrainian president implemented nearly all of Russia's security demands. These included a formal renunciation of the pursuit of membership in NATO and the dissolution of the institutions dedicated to it. Ukraine also changed the provisions of its strategic documents and allowed for the long-term stationing of the Russian Navy, the Black Sea Fleet, and Crimea. So, in fact, it fulfilled practically all the demands in the security sphere that the Russians were claiming towards Ukraine. The problem is that for Russia, this was not enough. Russia wanted more. 
Russia wanted not only to neutralize Ukraine, not only to deprive it of the prospect of NATO membership, but to impede, first of all, its process of gradual integration with the European Union and draw it into its own integration structures, participating in the so-called Eurasian integration. This was first expressed in 2010, but also later in 2014 when this issue became so pressing, in the so-called Customs Union, then the Common Economic Space and the Eurasian Union. Russia therefore not only demanded that Ukraine stop integrating with the European Union, but also demanded that Ukraine enter the Customs Union, the integration structures controlled by Russia. So NATO was not the threat here. What's more, even now we continue to have this narrative that NATO is this threat and that NATO is a problem from the point of view of Russian policy, so the Russians are looking for formal guarantees that Ukraine will never be in NATO. But if Russia was really convinced that NATO was a threat to it, it would not have withdrawn its forces from its posts on the border with Finland, a new NATO member, and the Baltic states, redeploying soldiers to the Ukrainian front. Such a situation could not be imagined unless Russia was convinced that NATO had no aggressive plans and that NATO was not preparing for aggression against the Russian Federation. From the very beginning, Russia wanted to subjugate Ukraine. The goal of the special military operation was a rapid occupation of Kiev and the overthrowing of the Ukrainian government. And a new, politically subordinate to the Kremlin government, would then take power. After that, Russia wanted to proceed from the position of strength to change the prevailing European order. This would involve implementing the concepts we mentioned earlier. First, in the form of negotiations, which according to the Russian ambitions, the West would enter being terrified of the strength of the Russian army. And if the negotiation plan failed, there would be an opening for further escalation. Today we are in a situation where Russia has failed to implement this plan. Its original aggression plan against Ukraine has been a complete failure. Ukraine is defending itself. Not only has Russia failed to occupy most of Ukrainian territory and failed to change the Ukrainian government, but Ukraine has regained a sizable portion of the territory originally occupied by Russia. It seems, however, that Russia still believes that a gradual realization of this original plan is possible and that the way to do this is to make a breakthrough, a breakthrough in Ukraine, militarily, politically, a breakthrough on the front, but also to force a de facto weakened Ukraine with reduced support from the West to negotiate a de facto surrender. And this will do two things. First, it will give Russia some breathing room, a few years for the Russian military to rebuild its potential, preparing for the next stage of aggression. On the other hand, it will provide political and psychological leverage and also an instrument to demand further concessions from the West. In recent weeks, Russian propaganda has been unusually optimistic. It has been focusing not so much on Ukraine, but on the West itself. Rosjanie, sam Putin prezentując olbrzymi, olbrzymi poziom Russians, Putin himself displaying a huge level of self-confidence declared, Ukraine is no longer a problem. Ukraine is already on its knees. Ukraine is about to collapse. This is not the main problem. The problem is the policy of the West, which is aggressive towards Russia. The West is the adversary. We have to deal with it. But what does this mean? It actually means declarations that we are already thinking about the next stage. We are already thinking about what comes after Ukraine, about the fact that this is not the end. I think the Russians are sincere in stating that, above all, the West, NATO, the United States are their adversary. It needs to weaken them and force them to make concessions, if only through blackmail or hybrid pressure. And finally, there is the possibility of military scenarios, limited military action in NATO's eastern flank with the possible use of nuclear blackmail. This will lead to Russia gradually achieving its plan. Of course, this is not a scenario in which Moscow will succeed, but the very fact that Russia believes that this is possible causes it to act on this belief. Russia will believe that the West is weak and that Ukraine will not be able to hold out for much longer, and it will adjust and calibrate its policies precisely for these types of aggressive scenarios. And here we come back to China. Russia and China are united in the goal of dismantling the American order. Moment, w którym między Rosją a Chinami mogą być pewne rozbieżności, to jest 
The moment where there might be some divergence between Russia and China depends on what instruments will be used, especially by Russia, whether Russia will use nuclear blackmail or nuclear weapons, whether there will be an escalation going beyond Ukraine and involving strictly NATO and Russia. Russia and China have somewhat divergent preferences regarding the pace and intensity of this process. The Russians are already at war with the West and are clearly declaring it. Anything that raises the stakes for all players, including Beijing, plays in their favor. From China's perspective, the preferred pace should be a bit slower. The process should be more orderly. To put it bluntly, the Chinese don't want the conflict in Ukraine to escalate into a world war before the Chinese themselves are potentially ready to take on such a clash. I think it will be Beijing itself that will set the calendar for when a war in the Pacific or an invasion of Taiwan will possibly happen, and not rely on Putin's policy of opening up this Western Front, this European Front, in a clash with the United States. Of course, he should be aided in withstanding American pressure, but at the same time, the temperature of the conflict in Europe should be kept low enough for the Chinese to play things out with the Americans on their own side of Eurasia, according to their own calendar and their own interests. However, this entire calculation could change if a war broke out in the Taiwan Strait. Because if there were a large-scale conflict in the Pacific involving U.S. industrial military resources, then, first of all, a window of opportunity opens for Russia to escalate in Europe, to test the cohesiveness of NATO, or even to resume conquest. And at the same time, a very clear synergy is created between the interests of China and Russia. The Chinese would have nothing left to lose. Any resistance they feel today in helping Russia, not wanting to lose Europe, not wanting to subvert their relationship with the United States, those resistances would disappear. The Chinese would then be in the conflict and would have no qualms, and even have a strategic interest in Russia being able to destabilize the American allies in Europe. First and foremost, the eastern flank, and then, deeper still, the German industrial base. Taiwan is therefore also important to the confrontation between Russia and the West. And if you want to know more about what's next for Taiwan, take a look at one of our videos here.